Whoa. For decades, Americans have struggled to find the balance between saving wildlife and, and serving guys. people. The thing is that people really do want to help, but they don't want to do that at great peril to themselves. You know, it goes back to the carrot and the stick. Uh, you can try to beat people into submission to help you, or you can provide incentives or at least get rid of disincentives to do good things. Good things are happening in Arizona. California condors are soaring above Grand Canyon National Park. Black-footed ferrets hunt and play in northern Arizona's Aubrey Valley. And Apache trout, Arizona's official state fish, are swimming in mountain streams. Each of these animals is at risk of extinction. They're listed as either threatened or endangered under the Federal Endangered Species Act. A lot of times when people think about the Endangered Species Act, they think about the, the way that animals get identified. They get put on the list. Larry so Riley is the Arizona Game and Fish Department's Assistant Director for Wildlife Management. That identification process is only one part of the Endangered Species Act. Another part, and it's a part that that we try to work on as a conservation organization Whoa. is the, the restoration and, and conservation and recovery of those species. Now that's hard. If you think about it, what we're talking about is taking away the threats that are bringing plants or animals to the verge of extinction. Congress passed the ESA in 1973 to try to eliminate those threats by prohibiting human activities that result in the take of a threatened or endangered species. Well, take, at least the way that it's defined in the Endangered Species Act, is a very broad term. It means to kill, to harm, harass, to trap, to hunt, to try to trap or hunt. All of those things are considered take. It's a broad definition that has the potential to severely limit or completely ban development, recreation, ranching, and other legal land uses in areas where listed species live. I believe all of us consider ourselves to be conservationists. But the challenge is, when you've got a threatened or endangered species in your backyard, you can possibly face regulatory limitations on what you do. You can find yourself breaking the law, even though you didn't intend to. Well, that can make it difficult for wildlife managers seeking public support and cooperation from landowners to reintroduce imperiled animals into the wild and onto their land. In the early days of the Endangered Species Act, there were a lot of restrictions that perhaps weren't necessary. Steve Spangle is with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal agency in charge of implementing the Endangered Species Act in Arizona. He says much needed changes took effect after Congress amended the act in 1982. We have a number of tools now that, that we didn't have in the early days. You know, in the early days it was pretty darn restrictive. There wasn't a lot of flexibility. Uh, but with the addition of 10J, 4D rules, which are for threatened species, uh, special rules, we have a number of these policies that if people do good things for the species, they're not going to get punished for it. Safe harbor agreements protect private landowners who voluntarily improve or restore habitat on their property for the benefit of a listed species. Right now we've got a really neat safe harbor agreement for two fishes, the Gila top minnow and, uh, and for pupfish. And so people with small ponds can say, I, I would like to have these, these fish. And if they get those fish under a safe harbor agreement, they won't face additional land use restrictions for having those endangered species on their land. That's a great tool. But the only tool like this that can also be used on federal public lands is Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act. Section 10J was used to reintroduce these Whoa. endangered black-footed ferrets in northwestern Arizona's Aubrey Valley. Reintroduction is a major undertaking that can stir up local opposition. So 10J was specifically designed to address that, to get rid of the fears of regulation. And in exchange, uh, folks were more tolerant of, uh, and even sometimes welcomed, uh, a new species on the landscape, even though it's technically listed under the ESA. 10J authorizes the Secretary of the Interior to designate a specific population of a listed species as an experimental population. 
but only after scientific evaluation and public review. The secretary also determines if an experimental population is essential or non-essential to the survival of the species. And experimental populations must be reintroduced in areas of their historic range where members of the same species do not already exist. So with a non-essential experimental population, which people really don't like that title, but it comes right out of the federal law, certain latitude can be provided under a special rule published by the, the, the federal government that allows for special management of that animal within a defined geographic area. So this non-essential experimental population affords us an opportunity to learn our way to better management of that species. It's that regulatory flexibility that has produced some Arizona success stories. Well, we have several. Uh, probably the, the biggest one is the black-footed ferret population up in Aubrey Valley. It was introduced under uh, 10J. Oxygen on three. Uh, it's been just beyond our wildest dreams successful. Uh, uh, we're getting tremendous productivity. We, we haven't put ferrets out in several years because they're just a self-sustaining population now. Now we have communities that look at the, the black-footed ferret project and say, that's a Chamber of Commerce project. We're proud of that project. And it's really a matter of setting the stage and help, helping people understand yeah. that, that we're not out to harm people, we're out to conserve wildlife for them and, and not over the top of them. Nobody's had any land restrictions. People still run their cattle and do the other things that they have done for generations. So it's just, I wish they could all be that way. But not all non-essential experimental populations are as easy to manage as the black-footed ferret. Mexican wolf, when you've got an animal that eats cattle, they're going to impinge on people's livelihoods. Uh, people raise cattle for a reason, and, and they can't sell ones that have been eaten by wolves. So there's that inherent economic conflict that 10J really can't address very well. Now, another part of 10J that, that, that is uh, gives us flexibility is we can go out and manage populations, whereas they're, if they're full, fully endangered or fully threatened, we may not be able to go out and, for instance, remove wolves that are a problem. But under 10J, we can do that and have. 10J has been effective at building public trust and support for reintroduction efforts. But maintaining that support is critical which is why the California condor is a concern to wildlife managers. It's the largest flying land bird in North America, a non-essential experimental population reintroduced near the Grand Canyon in 1996. It's not wildly successful. Uh, it, it, we've got birds out there. We've got birds that are living a fairly long time. We've got young being produced in the wild. But some of the birds are dying from lead poisoning. Lead fragments left in carcasses and gut piles left behind by hunters appear to be a major cause. Yeah, if you take a vital organ shot with a lead bullet, 90% chance that that gut pile is going to have lead in it. And Game and Fish responded by launching a voluntary non-lead ammo program that's been highly successful. Still, there are those who continue to call for a total ban on lead. Well, if that happened, uh, I think we'd be going back on a promise we made when we first reintroduced condors, and that's that we would not impinge on traditional lifestyles. And hunting's a big uh, part of the lifestyle where condors are. When a promise is broken, whether we break it or it's broken through litigation or somebody else jumps in and, and, and forces us to break that promise, we've still broken a promise, and that's not good business. It's not good public trust. Not everybody trusts government. And that's, that's not a new, uh, a new statement. Um, for, for my mind, I think that uh, we need to be able to make promises and keep promises if we expect folks to, to be our partners in conservation. We are the conservation. It gets back to finding that balance. And when people and wildlife are on the same side, it's always easier to tip the scale toward conserving endangered species. <laughs>